Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sandy. I'm a legal counsel at the Intellectual Property Office of Singapore. I'm very happy today um, to be with you all to share with you a little bit about IP dispute resolution. Um, to start the ball rolling, just to get a sense of what's going on, we shall have a poll now uh, to understand whether you have encountered any IP disputes resolutions before. Tiffany, please. Okay, and the participants should be able to see the first questions, uh, you know, on their screen already. So it seems that majority of you, at least uh, from what I can see, have not encountered any IP disputes. So that's a good thing. You haven't encountered any disputes before. Uh, hopefully, after today's session, you'll be well equipped so that in the event you do encounter an IP dispute, you will know what is the appropriate mode of dispute resolution which you can choose. So thank you very much, uh, Tiffany. Could you just, yep. Okay, sure. So um, for the purposes of my presentation, this is a huge, big overview of what I'll be sharing. First of all, I'll be sharing with you about the common types of IP disputes. Then I'll be sharing about the different ways of resolving IP disputes. Um, in particular, we'll be introducing today uh, the alternative dispute resolution modalities. Then I'll also share with you uh, as to what uh, we at IPOS do to help um, the dispute resolution uh, process, uh, some of our funding schemes and our courses and so on and so forth. First of all, the common types of disputes for IP, uh, as I can see just now, most of you have not encountered this, so this will be a good summary of the kind of IP disputes. Essentially, it can be divided into two big groups, contractual disputes and non-contractual disputes. For contractual disputes, as the name suggests, it means that there is an underlying commercial contract between two parties. As you can see here at the top of the list is licensing contract, whether it's for trademark, copyright patents. As you all know, licensing is the most common form to monetize uh, or commercialize your IP. And then after that, we have, uh, of course, R&B or research and development agreement, and technology transfer agreement, and of course, franchise agreement, and so on and so forth. On the non-contractual dispute side, in general, we have infringement disputes, uh, whether relating to trademark, copyright, or patents. Now, I will talk about the ways in which to resolve IP disputes. This is the most important slide uh, for my deck, and if uh, you cannot remember anything that I said today, this one will serve as a summary slide for the intent of my presentation today. There is many different ways to dis uh, resolve a dispute and this is called a dispute resolution spectrum. So at the most right, uh, most side, uh, the right hand side as you see is litigation. Uh, litigation is considered the most traditional or conventional way to resolve a dispute. Uh, the reason why it is at the rightmost side, as you can see below in the red box, the factors, uh, it depends on to what extent it um, includes or encompasses the different kinds of factors. So first and for foremost, for this litigation, there is absolute third party control over the process and outcome. So for example, the judge will determine the outcome of your uh, dispute on behalf of the parties you have absolutely no say as to how you want the dispute to be resolved. The process is also completely controlled by the rules uh, as well as the law and the regulations. It is very formal and it is a question of determining legal rights. You cannot consider underlying business interests. It is also very public. Um, if you all wish to sit in to a hearing at the High Court, you can. In fact, all you have to do is to go to the Supreme Court and sit in the public gallery and you can listen to uh, the trial going on. So it is very public. And of course, generally, uh, because of all the procedures involved, it tends to be of a higher cost. Now, right at the other end of the spectrum, on the blue side, you can see it is negotiation. Now, I'm sure most of you are well aware of negotiation. Essentially, um, parties can try to negotiate their dispute. So as you can see, um, in terms of party control over the process and outcome, there is no third party involved. Both parties on opposite sides have absolute control over the process and outcome. There is no rules and regulations as to tell you how to resolve your dispute. 
you can determine how you want to resolve the dispute and you can ultimately determine what is the final outcome that you want to reach. The focus is really on consensus, very informal. There's nothing that you have to comply with, no rules, no regulations, very confidential. So you don't have, if there's things that you do not want the public to know, you can have a closed door negotiation and no one knows that you're negotiating with someone. And because of this, there's no forms to fill, no rules to comply with, no one that you have to appoint generally is of a lower cost. Now, if you see right beside negotiation is mediation. Now, the reason it is right beside negotiation is because mediation, there is a third party involved, even though it is still confidential. But the main distinction is the third party cannot determine the outcome on your behalf. The third party has only, is only there to facilitate or to help or assist parties to come to a resolution. That's why it is right beside negotiation. Of course, it is generally also less formal in terms of process. Uh, it, which process you follow uh, depends on which mediation institute that you choose. Right in the middle, if you see the screen, is expert determination. The reason why it is right in the middle is you can appoint an expert to determine just a specific technical issue within your dispute. Now, this is very useful, for example, pattern disputes, which tend to be very technical in nature. So this third party is only um, authorized to settle that particular technical part of the dispute and not the whole dispute. And depending on the agreement, the outcome of the expert determination can be binding or non-binding on the parties. On the right-hand side of expert determination arbitration, and as you can see, that is closest to litigation. The reason why it is very close to litigation is because the third party, the arbitrator, will determine the outcome on your behalf. However, the main distinction is arbitration is confidential. And the other thing is you can choose the arbitrator of your choice. Both parties can come to an agreement and decide which arbitrator or arbitrators to decide your dispute. And, and so you have actually a wide range of people to choose from. And the main advantage is you can choose someone who is an expert in your specialist field to determine the outcome on your behalf. That's why arbitration is next to litigation. So as I mentioned again, this is really a whole summary of my presentation today. Uh, it is something that you can look again when you encounter IP dispute to decide which, is, which option is better suited for you to resolve your dispute before you. Now, I just want to give um, everyone a snapshot of the administrative and judicial resolution system in Singapore. Administrative because there's IPOS, we are a tribunal, we are not part of the judiciary, the judiciary. So we are called the administrative uh, resolution of, uh, we administratively resolve IP disputes in Singapore. Our disputes go straight to the High Court uh, on appeal, and then it goes up to the Court of Appeal. Just to let everybody know, within the High Court, we have the IP Court. What we mean by that is it's not a um, physically separate court from the High Court, but within the High Court, we have specialist IP judges who are definitely well-placed to resolve IP disputes. And also a note on SICC, or Singapore International Commercial Court, certain types of disputes can be resolved at the SICC. And again, we have very distinguished IP specialists who are sitting as judges at SICC. Now, I just want to quickly touch on this, and I will only um, say this uh, very quickly because I have already talked most about it at the spectrum, just now the summary. The whole point uh, of today's session is to introduce the different types of dispute resolution options, uh, which is mediation and arbitration and expert determination. The whole point of introducing everyone to this is because people are generally uh, familiar with the conventional dispute resolution process, which is litigation. And all we want to do is to introduce the different other type of modalities so that when you have a dispute, you can determine which is the most appropriate way and the best way to resolve your dispute. Okay, I can see that my time is running short, so I shall run straight um, into the next option.
which is the IPOS support schemes. Um, the rest of the different characteristics of the different modalities like mediation and arbitration, rest assured that our other panelists will be in a better position to explain to you later. So first and foremost, we have the Enhanced Mediation Promotion Scheme. Essentially, it is funding for parties uh, where, where they are mediate their disputes before IPOS, uh, where they mediate their disputes before IPOS. So as you can see on this slide, it is 10,000 per case, which means each party get $5,000 if it is local IPs. If a foreign IP is involved, it is $12,000 per mediation case, which means each party gets $6,000. Of course, there are uh, terms and conditions. Do approach us if you're interested in this. And um, the second last slide that I want to talk about is the IP legal clinic. We do offer legal clinics for those uh, who are encountering IP disputes. Um, it is a 45 minute session of consultation with our, uh, one of our lawyers from our panel and the cost you can claim reimbursement from us. The next one is IP business clinic. Again, you can ask, you can actually have complimentary advice uh, as to how to apply IP to your business for business strategies when it comes to IP, it is complimentary. Just to mention that the IP legal clinic will be closed for review at the end of the month, but between now and end of February, you are actually very welcome to sign up for our IP legal clinic. Last but not least, um, I just want to quickly do a poll now, Tiff. Sure, oh, just give me a quick second. Okay, and launching the poll, um, all the participants should be able to see or uh, send these second questions on which of these IP dispute resolution methods have you encountered before? Do you know that it's a multiple choice uh, question, so uh, participants can you know click more than one answer to apply. Okay, and sending uh, over to okay, you. Okay, negotiation. Okay, I think everyone is in a good state. Well, negotiation is the second um, popular option, but most of you have not encountered IP dispute resolution before. Okay. Um, Hopefully, after this session, you'll be more well equipped in the event you encounter an IP dispute. Okay, Tiff, can I have the next poll, please, just for sure. my last slide? Sure. Um, yep, launching the poll, and now the participants should be able to see the third question uh, posted on the question of which dispute resolutions method would you immediately think of if you have IP issues. Now, do note that this question is also a multiple choice. So do take some time to read through carefully which are the questions and uh, which are the answers that you'd like to click on, uh, as you can click more than one answer. <coughs> okay, and here you go. Ah, right, negotiation. Okay, um, that's good. That's a definitely a good start. And hopefully you'll be well equipped to deal with the other types from today onwards. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you find the session constructive and useful. Thank you. Okay. Okay, and thank you, Sandy. Thank you for the presentation. Now, next up, we have Miss Adriana Wilson, Head of Americas at SIAC. Adriana will be sharing the benefits and procedures for arbitration at SIAC. So, Adriana, please. Thank you, Tiff. Hi. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, my name is Adriana Usan. I'm SIC's Head of Americas, and I'm here to talk about resolving IP disputes through arbitration and to provide you with an overview of the Singapore International Arbitration Center, or SIAC. Uh, so to start, um, why arbitration? Well, arbitration offers an alternative mechanism to court litigation and has a number of advantages. Most of these have been touched on earlier by Sandy, but let me go through the list I have on the slide before you. So first is the flexibility of process in that parties have the autonomy to shape and tailor the proceedings to accommodate their needs. They can design or decide rather, for instance, the timetable of the proceedings. Uh, they can determine the number of arbitrators, the substantive law that they want to apply, uh, the language and place of arbitration, among others. Parties can also choose their arbitrators with special knowledge or technical expertise in IP, uh, something that national courts cannot always guarantee. 
SIC has recognized the importance of this. And as I will discuss later, we have created a specialized panel of IP arbitrators. Arbitral awards are also final and binding on the parties, unlike court judgments, and not typically subject to appeal or review on the merits, which can be seen as an advantage for some because it saves time and costs. Uh, another thing is that the confidentiality of arbitral proceedings and awards is particularly useful for IP disputes as the nature of an IPR usually means that proprietary or uh, commercially sensitive information or trade secrets are involved. Another advantage, especially in um, cross-border transactions, is that parties can choose a neutral forum that is detached from the parties' respective jurisdictions to avoid possible or perceived home court advantage by the other party. Uh, it also allows the parties to avoid, say, underdeveloped or unknown uh, legal systems. In arbitration, there is also a single forum which avoids the filing of multiple parallel court proceeding in every jurisdiction, um, for instance, where the patent has been infringed. And finally, in contrast to court judgments, arbitral awards are readily enforceable in 166 countries under the New York Convention. And this convention requires contracting states to recognize and enforce arbitral awards from other contracting states. Okay, now coming to SIC, we are a relatively young arbitral institution, only in operation for 30 years, but we have rapidly cemented our position as one of the leading arbitral institutions in the world. In 2018, SIC was ranked as the third most preferred arbitral institution, and we are one of the busiest in terms of international caseload. We have offices in Mumbai, Seoul, uh, Shanghai, Gif Gujarat, and this year we will be opening a physical office in New York. In Singapore, where we administer the cases, we are located in Maxwell Chamber Suites, which is connected to, to Maxwell Chambers, a fully integrated dispute resolution complex that houses hearing facilities and arbitrator and council offices. While our physical office in Singapore is currently closed on Tuesday and Thursday, SIC, SIC staff are telecommuting and we are still fully operational throughout the week and we also have a live chat feature on our SIC website for queries. Um, as I mentioned earlier, SIC has experienced very rapid growth. We started with only two cases in our first year of operation, um, but in 2020, despite COVID, we received more than a thousand new cases. We are an international institution. More than 80% of our cases are international, and of that, nearly half of the cases had no connection whatsoever in Singapore. Parties at SIC have come from over 100 jurisdictions with an average of 59 jurisdictions per year. So as an institution, our goal is to um, really assist the parties to ensure the smooth running of the arbitral process. Our case managers who are international lawyers qualified in both common law and civil law jurisdictions with various language capabilities assist in the appointment of the arbitrators. And I'll just show you the, here that we have a panel of over 100 experienced arbitrators in various fields and jurisdictions for parties to choose from. In case of IP disputes, we also have a dedicated panel of IP arbitrators who also come from various jurisdictions. Our case managers also supervise uh, and monitor the progress of the case. They also handle the financial management of the arbitral process. And I think the most important service we provide, in fact, we are probably one of the few institutions that review the award before it is finalized to enhance its um, enforceability. When we scrutinize an award, um, we, we, review, uh, we conduct a thorough review from typos to mathematical computations to looking at um, issues that might affect the enforceability of an award. SIC also consistently updates its rules to help limit the time and cost of arbitration. I highlight here, sorry, uh, some of the features of our 2016 rules. So first off, um, under our rules, a party can ask for an urgent interim relief even before a tribunal is constituted through our emergency arbitrator procedure. 
I understand that in some IP disputes, such as to protect trade secrets, it can be of key importance to obtain an, an urgent injunctive relief. Being the first institution in Asia to introduce this provision some 10 years ago, we have the advantage of experience and we are able to do this despite COVID. Our tried and tested case management techniques enable us to put in place and give effect to some of the fastest timelines in the world. Appointment of an EA is made within one calendar, um, not business day of receipt of the EA application by the registrar. And this 24 hour timeline to appoint an emergency arbitrator is very important because often we receive an emergency arbitrator application on a Friday night or on an eve of a holiday. And under our rules, we would generally have an EA appointed by Saturday morning. And this EA will have to issue an interim order or award within 14 days from his or her appointment. Another um, popular cost saving mechanism we have is the expedited procedure or fast track procedure where an award must be issued by the arbitrator within six months from his or her appointment. Parties can apply for this for relatively small value cases, uh, specifically when the sum in dispute does not exceed 6 million Singapore dollars or this is roughly around 4 million US dollars. Uh, parties can also opt to both ju just agree to this procedure or um, a party can also apply in cases of exceptional urgency. We also have an express early dismissal mechanism whereby a party may apply to the tribunal at any time during the course of the proceedings for the dismissal of a claim or defense that is manifestly without legal merit or manifestly outside the jurisdiction of the tribunal. Uh, this mechanism can potentially save time and cost because parties are able to strike out any number of heads of claim or defense that are not good in law or outside the four corners of an arbitration agreement instead of having the tribunal deal with it all the way until the end. Uh, we also have multi-contract consolidation and jointer provisions which all serve to save time and cost by streamlining the process. So under our multi contract provisions, a claimant only needs to file a single notice of arbitration for disputes arising out of multiple contracts. And in this scenario, the claimant would be deemed to have commenced multiple arbitrations, one for each arbitration agreement. And the notice of arbitration would be treated as an application for consolidation. Alternatively, a claimant can also file multiple notices of arbitration and concurrently submit an application to consolidate. Under our consolidation provision, two or more arbitrations can be consolidated into a single arbitration if both the parties agree or the dispute arises out of the same arbitration agreement or different but compatible arbitration agreements. So we don't need complete identity of the parties like in other institutions, which is a distinct advantage in multi-party disputes. Our joinder provision is designed very broadly and could allow both a non-party and a non-signatory to be joined if the parties agree or they are prima facie bound by the arbitration agreement. Finally, we also offer a unique service that combines the use of mediation and arbitration. We teamed up with the Singapore International Mediation Center to create what we call an ARB Med ARB protocol. This is a one-stop process where a dispute is first referred to arbitration, which is particularly helpful if there is a limitation period. Once the tribunal is constituted, the case is then referred to mediation with the Singapore International Mediation Center. And if the mediation results in a settlement, the parties may go back to arbitration and have a consent arbitral award issued on the terms agreed at the mediation. As earlier discussed, this consent arbitral award will have the benefit of enforceability under the New York Convention. Now, if mediation is unsuccessful, parties may go back to their already constituted arbitral tribunal and proceed with the arbitration. Uh, and, and that's really a brief insight of SIC. Thank you very much for your time. And I will now pass this back to Tiffany. Okay, hey, thank you, Adriana. Thank you for the presentation. Now, moving forward, our third speaker for today is Mr. Chuan Hui Ming, Chief Executive Officer at SIMC. Now, Mr. Chuan would like to be sharing on how mediation can benefit businesses and individuals in settling their IP disputes via SIMC role. Along with him, he also be sharing some successful case studies. So without further ado, uh, passing over to Wei Ming. Wei Ming, over to you. 
thank you, Tiffany. So uh, thank you, uh, Singapore Chinese Chamber of Commerce and Industry and IPOS for uh, inviting us. And thank you to the participants today for spending a portion of your afternoon with us. I hope you're enjoying a good cup of coffee as you listen to uh, each one of us. Uh, first of all, um, I'm the CEO of SIMC, and before I joined SIMC, I was both a litigator as well as in-house counsel with IBM, where I was general counsel in China for about 20 years before coming back uh, to Singapore. So in a sense, I, I have the benefit of, uh, of experiencing disputes, uh, especially IP disputes, both from a litigation, arbitration, as well as mediation perspective. So I hope to share some stories with you today. So next chart. I'm just going to talk very briefly about three questions here. What is mediation? I don't think I need to go too much into detail as uh, Sandy has given you some idea of that. Why mediation? And then why mediation now? I think that's the most important question. So next chart. What is mediation? Um, Sandy has said that mediation is a process where you invite a professional third party to, to help the parties to facilitate a, uh, a settlement. So it is not one where the mediator acts as a judge. He's not a judge, but he's an expert that helps the parties to, to understand their interests, understand the issues, understand how it may go in court, and then provide a guided discussion to a very um, uh, clear process to bring the parties together. So it's very much party-centric. The parties decide what they want. At the end of the day, if they are not happy, if any of the parties is not happy, they do not have to sign the settlement agreement. And that's the good thing about mediation. So you never come out of it unhappy because you either have a settlement, which is good, or if you don't have a settlement, at least you understand the issues a little better and you, nobody is going to force a, a, a final resolution on you. Um, so unlike a arbitration or a litigation where the judge or the arbitrator provides a solution or provides an award, a mediator does not provide a mediated solution to you. It is for the parties to agree. So why mediation? Next chart. There are basically a couple of really clear benefits. First, there's the neutrality, there's confidentiality. Um, because everything that's discussed within the mediation uh, cannot be used in court, uh, whether in arbitration or in litigation. So you can be very assured of um, parties being very open about solutions. Uh, the parties have full control over the outcome, like I've said. Um, you don't need to uh, agree if you are in any way unhappy with the solution. It can be discussed. It can be negotiated. And as a result of that, it's also very creative. Where, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. It's non-adversarial and flexible. So it preserves very good relationship between the parties. So my experience in IBM was one where we needed uh, 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 to mediate. Uh, we had a dispute with a, a party on the other side and we had a long-term relationship. And so it was very important for us to maintain that relationship. And it was really to a mediated uh, settlement, which I um, experienced firsthand, that I got the benefit of mediation. Um, and we were able to come up with a solution that is more uh, long lasting and continues a relationship. Time and cost savings um, relative to litigation and arbitration, is, the cost is really a fraction of, of what um, you would experience. And just to give a sense of the time saving, um, a mediation is usually done within a day and we can set up a mediation within the month itself. So if you have a dispute, uh, you can expect the solution to be uh, resolved uh, very quickly. Next chart. Uh, this is a Queen Mary study, which I thought was good to share with uh, all of you. Uh, you could see if you could uh, click the next. Yes, you can see the in-house council, which is really the parties uh, being represented, they have an overwhelming preference for um, uh, uh, mediation together with international arbitration. It's twice the number of uh, preferred um, uh, method of resolution compared to just international arbitration alone. So this gives you an idea as to why uh, parties really prefer um, mediation as being part of the process because of all the benefits that I've set up. Okay, next chart. 
So why mediation now? I think that's really the critical question. And you may have seen a lot of press uh, details on this uh, over the last um, 12 months or so. So first of all, it's the global recognition. Next chart. You will see in this beautiful photograph uh, that the Singapore Convention on Mediation was signed on 7th of August, 2019. And you see our prime minister there with really the heads of state of many of the delegated delegations that came and signed up on this, on this very auspicious day. It was held uh, uh, in conjunction with the United Nations where we recognize as the many countries coming together, 46 countries at a time, that we can have a mutually enforceable mediated uh, settlement agreement. So this is a tremendous um, um, promotion of mediation as a way of resolving uh, disputes and recognition by many, many countries. Next chart, you will see the countries involved here. 53 countries have signed so far and six have ratified. So the convention came to do force last year on 12th of September. And a majority of the countries here are based in, uh, in Asia, with the large uh, circle, as you can see there. And, and the major economies like the USA, China, India have all uh, signed up to the convention, although they have not ratified. But uh, over time, we expect more and more countries to ratify. Next chart. Again, um, when we talk about global recognition, as you can see, we are in very close uh, contact with benchmark from uh, Chambers in the International, which is really a Chinese um, um, uh, platform uh, for mediation. We have very strong relationship in Japan, in Korea with KCAB, as well as in India, where we have specialist mediator training. So all through the region and in the key markets, you can see mediation becoming more and more recognized and, uh, and popular uh, with more uh, commercial uh, businesses, especially in the IP area, um, seeing this um, uh, as a really viable form of dispute resolution. Next chart. And of course, I have to mention our collaboration with WIPO, with Kiara on the line, who will speak after me. Uh, we have this uh, good MOU uh, collaboration where we say, let's, how, let's see how we can promote um, IP disputes with, um, with mediation. And, and we're working together both on training as well as seeing how we can case manage some of these uh, disputes together. Next chart. Why mediation now? First is global recognition. Second is enforceability. Next chart. Um, um, Adriana spoke about the upmed up. I won't go further into it, except to say that this is really a very successful one-stop process we have with SIAC, where we're able to enforce these um, mediated agreements through uh, the New York Convention. Next chart. We also signed last year a uh, MOU with the SCIA, the Shenzhen Court of International Arbitration. This is very uh, useful, I thought, to bring up with uh, members of the uh, SCCI because this is the first time that a arbitral uh, center has given recognition to a uh, mediated agreement, not through arbitration, just by mediated agreement for it to be enforceable uh, in, in that center. This means that if you have a mediated agreement, let's say you have an IP dispute, it's just mediated between the two parties with SINC, this agreement is enforceable in China through SCIA. So in Singapore, enforcement is not an issue. In China, through the SCIA, it's not an issue as well. So this is quite groundbreaking. The third reason for mediation now is really COVID-19, uh, as we are all experiencing and having this uh, um, seminar over Zoom. Next chart. This is what a mediation at the time of COVID-19 looks like. You know, it looks like a war room where everybody sits around uh, one meter apart, where you have your mask on. And, and, and everyone here, are, everyone in a room are the lawyers that are representing the parties. And you can see the big screen there. Um, uh, where parties will call in um, over Zoom or over Blue Jeans or whatever platform that will be on to provide them the immediate and uh, timely uh, updates on what's what's happening to the mediation, so we can we can interact both in person safely within the social uh, distancing guidelines as well as with all the parties who are calling. So it's a very powerful hybrid 
method of uh, resolving the dispute. Next chart. Um, I mentioned that the media has picked up a lot of these um, uh, mediation efforts and initiatives, and we've been in the different uh, newspaper in Singapore, as well as uh, Japan, etc., where there's a really a growing recognition that uh, mediation is really a very suitable way to resolve um, disputes, especially during this COVID-19. Um, and the next chart, you will see that we have launched the COVID-19 protocol, SIMC, where we will have the entire mediated um, settlement done online um, from case filing to the mediation to preparation, any follow-up, et cetera. And you will see probably most pertinent to the participants here is how inexpensive it can be. It can be anything from three to $10,000, depending on the dispute value uh, per party. Um, and of course, this is also uh, flexible based on the the complexity as well as the, who are the mediators involved. And you heard from Sandy earlier that the IPOS is very happy to uh, subsidize um, up to $12,000 um, for, for a mediation. Um, and so it's $6,000 per party. So you can see that substantially, almost all your mediated fees can be uh, subsidized by uh, IPOS because certain rules will apply, certain conditions will apply. And we're very happy that this COVID-19 protocol has received tremendous um, support from, from the team. And in fact, we've seen almost doubling of our number of disputes uh, here in SIMC and all of them, almost all of them are international in nature. So if anyone has any questions, we're very happy to, uh, to uh, take them up uh, offline with each one of you. Next chart. Oh, this case study, I just want to very quickly mention this case study, which I thought was, was, was it would be interesting. This is really a dispute, uh, you could uh, click on it. Uh, you will see that this is a dispute that involved both Europe and, um, and Southeast Asia, where a dispute was actually filed in Europe, but the use of this act is in Asia. And there was a dispute between um, the, the technical supplier, the supplier of the technology and their subcontractor. And as a result of that, there was a problem with providing this final uh, resolution, this final solution to the end user here. So the end user was very concerned because um, obviously there are thousands of people on this app and uh, the, the, the robustness, the ability of the, ability, the, of the app itself is in question. So we brought all three parties into uh, a one-day uh, mediation, and I'm happy to report that they've got a solution uh, amongst all three parties, and they were able to move this app to a third party to, um, uh, to host, um, and there were some um, monetary payments being made amongst the three parties. So the important thing at the end of the day is that the solution, the technical solution, the app itself was not affected in any way. The parties, the, the users continue to be able to use the app, but the parties were able to resolve their financial dispute, the contractual dispute um, through the mediation itself. So in one day, instead of waiting for a couple of years for this matter to be heard in Europe, we were able to resolve it uh, here successfully here in, in Asia, in Singapore. Next chart. So just, I'll just very quickly go through the rest of the charts. Uh, I see my time is running out. We are a very young organization, uh, only six years old. We are not for profit and therefore we're able to manage a lot of our costs internally. Next chart. Uh, just some photographs of uh, our panel. We have an international panel from uh, 70 different countries, uh, 17 different countries and uh, more than 70 of them. Uh, as you can see, a lot of them based in Asia, and a lot of them are IP experts as well. Next chart. And this is just a uh, 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 to show you that uh, although we are quite young, we've had more than 140 cases so far, with dispute value of three billion. So on average, every case is more than 25 million US dollars. So they are fairly large uh, uh, disputes. Of course, we have small ones as well, a few hundred thousand, but some of them run into um, like the particular uh, dispute I was talking about earlier. That was uh, in, uh, I think it was about 10 million or so. So it's a fairly large dispute. We have a ever settlement rate of 70 to 80%. Um, and you can see all the top users um, uh, uh, is from all over the world. 
uh, with a lot of, uh, uh, of them come from India, US, and China. So in my last two charts, uh, even a sheet of paper has two sides. There are always two ways to look at uh, dispute. The question is rather than fighting it out, whether the parties are willing to do this in a creative way, resolve this in a creative way so that you could form a beautiful uh, origami like you see in this uh, picture here. So on this basis, I thank you uh, for spending time with us. Hope that helps. Thank you. Okay, and thank you, Wimeng. Okay, last but not least, we have with us today Miss Kiara Akinero, who is the legal office and representative of WIPO Center. Now, she'll be sharing how you can resolve your IP and technology disputes through the WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Center. Kiara, please. Thank you very much, Tiffany, and thank you all for, for joining this session. It's really a pleasure um, to be here and to present a little bit of our experience uh, with uh, arbitration and uh, mediation. So, so first, my, my name is Chiara. I'm a lawyer. I'm originally from, uh, from Italy, and I'm the representative of the WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Center in uh, Singapore. Uh, now, first things first, uh, uh, who, who is WIPO? What do we do? Uh, WIPO stands for World Intellectual Property Organization. So that's an agency of the United Nations which is specialized in intellectual property. Maybe some of you uh, may already be familiar with WIPO uh, because WIPO provides a number of services for businesses. Uh, so it facilitates, for example, the uh, international registrations of, of trademarks or patents or design. Now, something else that WIPO also provides is the uh, resolution of disputes, in particular IP and technology disputes through mediation and arbitration. And that's what we do at the center. And, and really what we try to do, and that's the reason why WIPO also started providing mediation arbitration services, is to reduce the impact that disputes have on your business. So that's why we focus so much on the time and cost efficient dispute uh, resolution. Now, a couple of words uh, about the center. Uh, we we have uh, two um, offices. One is in Geneva in Switzerland, and then we have one external office uh, in uh, Singapore, where I'm based. Uh, let me just say that, uh, of course, uh, you probably did notice already from this last year, uh, to have a dispute mediated, arbitrator, a wipe, you don't have to go to uh, Geneva or to come to Singapore. Uh, that can take place uh, anywhere in the world, uh, and it has done so. Uh, Maybe uh, because we are part of the World Intellectual Property Organization, so a UN organization, we do have a couple of, uh, I would say, uh, special features. The first one is uh, we are completely neutral. So this means that we have no link with any uh, jurisdiction, law, country, or language. And this is actually something that could be useful uh, if you're ever dealing with an international dispute, so with parties coming from different jurisdictions. So there, having a neutral forum, which has no link to either of the party, can actually be more acceptable to both parties. So one is this neutrality. And second, because we are part of, um, of WIPO, of the World Intellectual Property Organization, of course, we specialize in intellectual property and uh, technology. What does this mean? It means that, for example, we, we also have a panel of uh, more than 2,000 experts in all areas of IP and technology, but also that we have some specific rules with some uh, specific provisions uh, that were really drafted for IP disputes. We are also going to see that a bit more uh, into detail. Uh, we are uh, not for profit, meaning that, of course, we try to, to, to make uh, the process as cost effective as possible, but we also have some special schemes, some also applying in Singapore, a very interesting one um, I would like to also mention in, in China, uh, where uh, parties can benefit from um, a very sort of not-for-profit low uh, schedule of uh, fees. Uh, so what, what do we do in practice? Uh, how can we help really businesses resolving uh, disputes? Well, even before actually there is a dispute, we also provide procedural assistance. So this means that uh, we are available um, 
course, free of charge to, to, to help parties draft um, uh, ag agreements. So, for example, contract clauses, uh, submission agreements, uh, which have a dispute resolution clause, a mediation clause, an arbitration clause. We have model clauses. Uh, we can help you do that with a more sort of personalized uh, approach, taking really into account specific collaboration. And then once there is a case and there is a, a mediation or arbitration submitted uh, to the WIPO Center, we administer the case. Uh, so basically our role is to make sure that the case is on track. Uh, so it means that we enforce timelines. Uh, we, we also help the parties choosing uh, the arbitrator or the mediator. We also have some you know, uh, online tools uh, such as video conferencing. We also have an online platform where documents can be uploaded that that's called WIPO EADR uh, but but I think that our uh, sort of help uh, choosing the mediator and the arbitrator is important and is even more important when you're dealing with an IP dispute because uh, um, as my co-panelists have also mentioned before IP disputes can be very specific so really the specialization uh, the, the technical background sometimes business background of the mediator the arbitrator is essential uh, so, so so we do have this uh, uh, very wide list of more than 2,000 experts which is available uh, to act as mediators and arbitrators and you know these experts experts are not just experts in IP, so in, you know, uh, patents or trademarks or design, but sometimes we also have experts which are, um, which have expertise in a specific business area. Uh, so for example, it can be telecommunications or, or fintech or uh, film and media, because sometimes also the, the, the understanding of the business is something which is, uh, which is really important. Uh, now, I, I mentioned our online tools. Um, this is something that we've always had, but uh, of course, this is something that has been used uh, increasingly uh, in, in, the, in the past year. Um, and I'm talking about video conferencing services. Those are uh, managed by WIPO, and they have been used um, in quite a number of mediation arbitrations, either in a completely online format or also in an hybrid format. So what we've done with the cases that we have seen online, we've also prepared a sort of checklist uh, that can be useful for uh, both the parties, uh, but the arbitrators and the mediators as well when dealing with uh, an online uh, procedure. And let me just say that um, our experience so far has been uh, very positive. I mean, personally, beyond expectations, really. Um, uh, even uh, um, we had seen an increase of the settlement rate for uh, mediations conducted online. Um, of course, it does require some extra preparation or let's say some, some different preparation of the mediation, but it was something that worked very well. And, and um, this, is, this is a service which is provided free of charge, this online services. So it's also a way to contain the cost of the proceedings. Uh, so that's something that uh, we make available. Um, of course, we do have rules, mediation rules, arbitration rules, um, and these rules, uh, they are applicable and suitable for all commercial disputes. So we have also, um, you know, uh, provisions on, on consolidation, interim measures. Uh, but on top of that, we also have uh, a couple of provisions that were really drafted thinking of intellectual property disputes. So, so for example, we have a very strict confidentiality code, some confidentiality provisions. Uh, we also have some specific provisions on technical evidence, which basically uh, explain how some uh, technical evidence uh, can be introduced. And um, for example, experiments, site visits, you know, these are all elements that may be present in IP disputes. So it's quite useful to have a body of rules uh, governing that. At the same time, and that's really one of the main advantages of both mediation and arbitration, these rules can also be modified by agreement uh, by the party. So there is this flexibility, uh, which is part of the procedure. Um, and then we've seen cases where the parties decided to modify, for example, timelines. Uh, so they say, no, we want absolutely the mediation to be done within, I don't know, a couple of weeks or three weeks. Um, so, so, so we can make that happen, of course. Um, 
I don't want to spend too much time on, on, on clauses because I'd rather give you some, some practical examples of some of the cases that we've seen. But just to mention that we do have model clauses. And uh, for mediation in particular, we also have the, the, the possibility for one party to request the mediation unilaterally. And I actually want to mention because um, I, I saw someone asking, uh, what if uh, I have a dispute with the other party, but the other party does not reply, has not paid for the services, so I'm not sure how to get in touch with the other party. Well, of course, for a mediation, you need the consent and the agreement of the other party to proceed, but perhaps we can help with that because if you file a unilateral request for mediation, then uh, WIPO can also get in touch with the other party. Uh, so perhaps there they may reply and we can help them um, considering the request for, for, for mediation. So it's just a, uh, just a thought. And um, so because um, we're part of WIPO, we also uh, collaborate with uh, um, an increasing number of intellectual property offices as well as courts. Uh, now the, the list is, is much longer than that. This is just the beginning of the list. Um, and, and IPOS, the IP office in Singapore, was actually the first collaboration that we have had since 2011. Um, and together with IPOS, we have developed a WIPO media option for uh, proceedings before IPO. So for example, if you are involved uh, in, a, in a trademark proceedings before IPO, so you have the option to uh, resolve the dispute through WIPO mediation. So uh, then we have developed also um, some, some uh, Singapore-based mediators. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention is that uh, we also have, uh, because of, of, of the current situation, um, a, a, a particularly um, profitable um, schedule of fees, which is lower. Uh, so basically, until the end uh, of April, the WIPO Center is waiving uh, our admin fee. Uh, and there is a cap for the mediator's fees of 5,000 Singapore dollars. So that means that the, 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 the maximum cost of a mediation for these proceedings is 5,000, which is usually uh, split 50-50. So uh, I, I think that's, that's also something um, that could be worth uh, considering. And uh, uh, this is just uh, a case that we have seen um, last year. This was a mediation of a trademark dispute before IPOS. And this was an excellent example because here we had two parties, one from Thailand and one from the US. But actually the dispute involved other six jurisdictions. So it was a total of seven jurisdictions uh, with disputes in all these places. And all those disputes were settled in Singapore. Um, a settlement was reached, a settlement covering all jurisdictions jurisdictions within a day. And here the parties also use the funding from IPOS, the EMPS. Uh, so this was, uh, uh, I find, a very uh, excellent example of how mediation can help you resolve also um, disputes uh, internationally. Now, uh, this is uh, uh, you know, one of our latest developments. We also collaborate in, in China with the Supremes um, Court, uh, and we have been uh, accredited, so we've been recognized to provide mediation and arbitration services in, uh, in China. Uh, so it, it's possible to refer IP cases to uh, WIPO mediation. And in particular, uh, now we have this special scheme only until the end of the month, but for referral of IP disputes before um, the, the IP uh, Court of Shanghai and Pudong District Court, uh, there is a free mediation scheme so the 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 um, the, the mediation uh, is done pro bono by some of our mediation mediators uh, uh, there. Uh, we've already received uh, um, uh, last only last year some 18 cases, and they range really from, from trademark disputes to disputes in the area of, of patents. Uh, there was uh, one in the area of, uh, of, um, of pharmaceuticals, for example. Uh, so, so this is a, a brief overview of our uh, experience dealing with, uh, with IP disputes. Um, I, I think we do have some some time for uh, Q and A, so I'll be very happy to to answer to uh, to any any questions there. Okay, Kara, Kara, 
Hi, Kara. Yeah, I believe you have end the whole uh, presentation already. So, you know, we will proceed on with the Q&A sessions itself. So um, just to follow up, for those who would like to receive the presentation deck, please scan on the QR code shown on the screen and fill in your feedback form details to receive the slides. Alternatively, we'll be sending you the URL link to participants who have attended the webinar session today after the event to fill up the feedback form too. Now, I understand some of you are using your mobile phone. So, um, you know, you guys will still be receiving the URL link via email. So, probably after that, you can also fill up the feedback form. So, without further ado, let us welcome back our four speakers for the Q&A session, as well as Sandy, who will be doubling up as the moderator for this session. Now, if you have any questions for our speakers, feel free to submit them by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and type in your questions. Do note that as we have limited time for the Q&A sessions, we will not be able to answer all questions. Trust we seek your kind understanding that should your questions not be able to answer during the session, please contact IPOS, SIAC, SIMC, or WIPO Centre directly with their contact details featured on the screen or email SCCCI and we will forward your inquiries to them too. So now, without further ado, I'm passing over to Sandy. Sandy, please. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, yes, so as uh, Kiara has mentioned, we actually have received a few questions right now. So um, just to uh, read again the question which uh, Kiara uh, had answered. So basically, the question is, what can I do if the other party do not want to talk or reply anymore? Uh, but they still have not paid up for my services and they are based in overseas. So as Kiara mentioned, uh, WIPO has this uh, unique service which, uh, which is called the unilateral request for mediation so they can approach um, the other party on your behalf. Uh, I think uh, one of the important things that we want to uh, push forward at this session is moving forward um, in the event that you have another contract so it is pertinent for you to uh, include a dispute resolution clause uh, what it means is basically you insert a clause to say that in the event of dispute, you can proceed to mediate and arbitrate and that will help things a lot. Uh, because at this point, if your contract does not provide for that, then while you can still mediate, uh, for example, by approaching WIPO to reach out to the other party, it's a bit more complicated. So that's one thing that I can propose. Um, okay, I have the next question here. Uh, it's directed at Weeming, but I believe uh, a lot of the panels can also answer this. Considering num the number of experts involved and the disputes probably may not be resolved uh, within a day, what is the reason why mediation fee is so reasonable? 3000 to 10000 per party. Weeming, over to you. Uh, thanks, Sandy. Um, before I get onto that question, um, I think to um, Kiara's earlier point about providing the unilateral um, approach to, to uh, mediation. Uh, SIMC, we, we do that quite often as well, where we get one party coming to us and say, hey, you know, we don't know whether the other side is willing to mediate, but uh, we are certainly willing to. So could you help us to contact uh, the other party? And we have done so uh, very successfully uh, for parties in China and different places. So I, I think that's something we can all work together, either with WIPO, with IPOS, um, you're most welcome to uh, seek that clarification from SIMC as well. As to the specific question on why it's so reasonable, it's because uh, it, is, it is the time of COVID. So when we got together uh, as management in SIMC, we recognized that there is a crying need in the community for quick solutions to, to, be, um, to be put forward, to help parties to come out of the COVID in a stronger position than before. So we um, uh, decided that we will approach all our mediators, uh, both the senior as well as the, the, the not so senior ones to say, can we work out a scheme that will help parties to resolve the issues quickly? And all of them have been very supportive. And like Kiara say, you know, they have capped their fees. What was originally X amount, they'll say, okay, we'll do it at 50% discount, et cetera. And likewise, as I am we have also kept our fees um, uh, drastically because we understand that uh, at the end of the day, we're here to provide a service to the community, especially at a time like this. And we're happy that uh, with the COVID-19 protocol that we've put out, which is, like I say, $3,000 to $10,000. And in many cases, there were $3,000 cases 
paid by the parties. And we have senior counsels coming in <laughs> to, to mediate for us. Uh, you think about it, right? Uh, for some of the senior counsel, it, it costs maybe $3,000 in I don't know, two hours or so. <laughs> but they are there to, to mediate. And, and, and they go on till late in the evening, right? Uh, way past the six o'clock. Uh, in one case, I know they ended up almost 10 o'clock. And, and they still, you know, the party still pay $3,000 for uh, per, per party. So it is really a way of uh, helping, supporting the businesses out there uh, during this time. And uh, in SIMC, we have extended this uh, COVID-19 protocol to June of this year, um, really depending on how the situation is to, to, to evolve. But uh, we're very happy that we're able, with our mediators, provide this cap fee for all parties. Kiara, would you like to say something about this or? Indeed, there's the same reasons also our mediators, uh, even uh, the, the, in China or in Singapore also we had this uh, sort of pro bono free mediation period. It's a way really to, to help businesses resolve their disputes. And I feel like it's also the, the, the job of, of us like an institution to, to, to provide uh, an efficient service in, in terms of cost. So we try to keep it as efficient as possible because really our disputes take a lot of time, cost, resources. So that's where I say that we try to limit the impact that these have. That's 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 a way to do it. Uh, perhaps just just a thought. Another way uh, could be considering also online tools. Uh, that's an excellent way to, to also in a way contain the cost because they may be um, even even for free, uh, and uh, they they can save you also quite quite a bit of money. Okay, sounds good. Um, actually, I'm just curious, Adriana, if you could just, uh, uh, would you like to comment a little bit on the cost for SIAC, how it's being calculated? And in fact, I'm curious if let's say one party wants to arbitrate and the other party doesn't, would, uh, you know, SIAC, do they have any um, programs involved to help resolve this issue? Yes, uh, thank you, Sandy. So um, SIC calculates the tribunal's fees and SIC's fees um, based on our schedule of fees, which is calculated on an ad valorem or based on the sum and dispute. And we also have fee caps. So at the outset, parties can already uh, calculate the maximum exposure that they have. We have a fee calculator on our website. Actually, you can just key in the the amount of dispute, the number of arbitrator, and it will generate um, sort of an estimate of how much it will cost. Uh, that being said, uh, we uh, are open to parties proposing the kind of payment. It can be an hourly rate. It doesn't have to be um, based on, on the schedule itself. We uh, asked you a question of what do we do if another party doesn't want to pay for, for their share of the cost of arbitration. So SIC being um, uh, supervising the whole process. We, of course, try as much as possible to make sure that both parties share in the deposits of the arbitration uh, proceedings. And if they are unable to do so, we have under our rules um, a provision where a claimant, for instance, can ask the arbitrator to issue an order or an award awarding the claimant who paid for the deposit of the respondent. Because to, in order to, to continue on with the process, an, uh, a claimant may be asked to pay on behalf of the respondent, but this can be recovered by the claimant at some point in the arbitration towards award or, or even before that by asking the tribunal to issue uh, an order in that effect. Mm. Okay, um, Adriana, actually I have a question here. Um, mm -hmm. Since you're talking about cost, is there a minimum amount to the dispute before considering arbitration? Um, there's no minimum amount. So uh, we accept, uh, you know, even very low value dispute. Uh, we do have a minimum administration fee of about 3,800. And we also have the filing fee um, of, of 2,000 for, for local cases, Singapore cases, and 2,140 Singapore dollars for, for overseas um, parties. But um, apart from that, there's, there's really no minimum amount for us to accept a case. Thank you, Sandy. Okay. Um, I have this question here. Please explain the difference between asking help from IPOS and WIPO. When should I ask help from IPOS and from WIPO. Okay, I'll just do a quick start and Kiara, you can chime in when you want. So essentially, if you have a dispute before IPOS, at the case management conference, we will definitely ask parties whether you wish to mediate. And then at that point in time, we uh, you are free to choose your mediator, whether it's uh, 
YPOMC under Kiara or SIMC under Weiming or even um, under SMC, which is another mediation institute. So that uh, if the dispute comes from IPOS, uh, IPOS will direct you to the mediation institution. So Kiara, would you like to chime in? Absolutely. Uh, so, so that's the, the, the main difference. And, and then in general, uh, IPOS is the intellectual property office of Singapore, while IPOS role, uh, well, it, it's not connected to, to, to any country, it's not linked to any country. So it's a global forum for IP. So for example, one thing that WIPO does is it facilitates the registration of, uh, you know, patents, design, trademarks, uh, worldwide in all jurisdictions. Then of course, in Singapore, we, we, we collaborate uh, with, uh, with the IP office but but the reach is uh, um is, is quite different okay um let me see so um i have a question for the panel actually since we don't have any questions i'm out of curiosity um so um how do we actually start if we need a media if i need a mediator or arbitrator how should i go about um finding the arbitrator or mediator, um, please feel free to join me. Maybe Adriana, you can start first. Yes, um, so to initiate a proceeding with SIC, the claimant would only have to file a notice of arbitration. It's really a simple document. The requirements of what you have to put in a notice of arbitration is set out under our rules. So name of the parties, the type of dispute, a summary of the relief that is being claimed, and so on and so forth. So that's under our rule three. Um, the parties can, can choose their own arbitrator. I, I mentioned earlier that we have a panel of arbitrators arbitrators in our SIC um, list, but they are not bound or limited to, to those um, names. So they can nominate or propose their names to us, and then we will take it from there. We will um, conduct the conflicts check and see their availability. So, so that's really basically how, how to start an arbitration with us. You mean, would you Thank like you. to... Uh introduce the process for SIMC? Sure. So for SIMC, uh, it's really a filing fee of $250 Singapore uh, with SIMC. And then we'll start the process um, of finding out from the parties um, what kind of dispute it is. Um, and of course, it's not just IP related. We deal with all sorts of disputes, um, construction, uh, JV, etc. And And from there, understanding the needs of the party, we will find a the appropriate mediator for you. Uh, we will take into consideration uh, language, we'll take into consideration um, culture. Uh, we, we, for example, we have had uh, parties where they are comfortable with a mediator who speaks some Chinese so that they could um, relate better. So the mediator will speak both English and Chinese, um, but of course, ensuring that both parties are completely aware of what's happening. So there are all of these other factors that will come in to find them the most uh, appropriate um, mediator for that case itself. Um, we also have a joint protocol with uh, Japan, um, which is quite interesting, where we say that we have one mediator from Japan and one mediator internationally. So these are disputes specific to Japan because Japanese parties often want to have someone who's Japanese. So the two mediators will work together to resolve the issue. And this is also under our COVID-19 where we uh, subsidize the, the party. So one thing I want to just clarify before we have any misunderstanding is that all the organizations represented here, IPOS, uh, WIPO, SIAC, SIMC, we all work together. We collaborate <laughs> with each other. We do not compete with each other to try to get the... the thing. So I just want to clarify that. And which is why we have MOU with all the other parties because we want to be collaborative. We want to find what is best for the for the uh, uh, businesses. So, in that spirit of collaboration, in the spirit of helping out uh, all the businesses, is that we we provide the best solution. So, you know, feel free to approach us for any help or support that you that you need. Thank you, Kiara. No, indeed. Get a proceeding. 
So for, for WIPO proceedings, uh, that starts with, with the request for either mediation or arbitration. Uh, for mediation, they can be done uh, unilaterally. We also have online forms to make it as simple as possible. But I also wanted to spend just a couple of words on, on the appointment that because I, th I feel like that's where having an institution really can help and, and perhaps make the difference because it's also the quality of the mediator of the arbitrator contributing to the quality of the mediation arbitrators. So, and again, for IP disputes, they can be quite uh, quite crucial uh, so, so again we also try to actually we don't just select someone we just just appoint someone but we try to understand what kind of disputes the parties have and what kind of preference they have in terms of you know uh, cultural background technical background languages so we do try to get that feedback from the parties and that on that basis we have a look at our list of 2000 experts beyond that list if need be and then we propose some candidates to the parties of course, if the parties already come to us proposing a, a mediator, arbitrator, they've already agreed upon, that's fine as long as that person is independent and impartial. This happens sometimes, not all the times, because it's, it's, it's a situation of a dispute, so parties may not be able to agree on much, uh, let alone the mediator or the arbitrator, and that's where uh, we, we, we can really help. Actually, on that note, uh, Chiara, we have a question for you and thereafter, Adriana. Uh, how do I get accredited by WIPO and SIAC? So maybe, Chiara, you would like to start first. Absolutely. I understand the, um, how to become basically a WIPO mediator or, or arbitrator. Uh, well, uh, as I mentioned, we have a really wide list of experts. So, so that's really people with more uh, technical uh, background, but, but also lawyers, uh, arbitrators. Uh, so we do not have a standard process or, or specific trainings. We look really at, at the profile uh, more widely. Uh, so you can just send us an, an email including perhaps uh, your, your profile and that uh, on that basis will be um, we'll get in touch with, with you and see if perhaps some some training is needed or uh, some specific areas uh, that, that can be that can be of interest uh, that can be of interest for you so so reach out to us mm. adriana over to you yeah in our case um you can submit your application and your cv with us the the a copy of the form is actually on our website we've also posted the standards or the um, minimum requirements that we we have for our main panel and um, these would be tertiary education or at least 10 years post-qualification experience. Um, we also require fellowship from the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators or a similar professional body. Um, we, we require experience as an arbitrator in five or more cases and somebody who has completed at least two commercial arbitral awards. Uh, the person also has to be aged between 30 and 75 years old. And so if you have all these qualifications, <laughs> please, please do feel free to submit it to us um, at panel at sic.org.sg. Um, but you know, the, the other thing that not a lot of people know is that even if you don't meet all of these requirements, we have what we call a reserve panel. So we, um, SIC, would like also to promote you know, younger practitioners. Um, and like Kara was saying, you don't have to be um, a lawyer or in the legal profession if you're an expert in some field. Uh, you may apply with us as well. Our executive committee will be um, considering the application on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Adriana. Okay, I think our time is almost there. Um, uh, that's all about it, actually. Uh, Tiff? Okay, can you share? Thank you, Sandy. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, moderating and definitely a big thank you to, you know, Adriana, Weiming, and Chiara for their time and valuable sharing today. Now, we hope that you have benefited a lot from the webinar sessions. Once again, to the participants who are still online with us, do fill up the feedback form if you wish to receive the presentation slide shared today. Now, we hope to look forward to seeing you in our future events and wishing you to stay safe and healthy. And thank you very much for attending today's webinar sessions.